Hi, Efrain. Nice to have you. All right, and so let me write down your name. Hello. All right, I'm glad to have you. All right, and so um, we're working on test two for history 31. So let me share the, the screen and go to the uh, test one material. Let's see here, show all windows. Sorry. Where are you? I know I opened it up. Come on. There it is. All right. So part one, right, just a, a paragraph or two, I'd like you to describe from, from the, uh, the Norte Americano Goliath handout, uh, that which enabled the U.S. to take Mexican territory. And so if you go to that one, right, Let's see here. Find it here. For one, right, the argument is conveyed that the, the North Americanos of, of the U.S., they did not take on the fundamental uh, issue of human rights and universal citizenship. Uh, they kicked that can down the road, and that was bittersweet. Uh, it caused, uh, you know, a, a political gridlock that was finally uh, faced when they took the West, when they took the far West from Mexico, um, and it culminated in the Civil War, to, to whatever degree you believe slavery was the cause of the Civil War, which is argumentative, but in one way or another, it was definitely connected to the Civil War. I don't know how you cannot say it wasn't, and, um, and so in a short period of time, it allowed for greater stability for the U.S. In Mexico, they took on issues right away, uh, you look at Vicente Guerrero, <clears throat> you look at uh, Mr. Alvarez, you look at um, uh, Gomez Farias. Uh, these were more liberal, uh, enlightened men. Uh, and then, of course, you look at the revolutionaries, Hidalgo uh, and Father Morelos. Uh, they wanted universal citizenship. They wanted, uh, in some cases, land redistribution. I mean, they had a stomach for greater, more fundamental change uh, to change the inequities of colonization by Spain. And so um, Mexico is going to be very tumultuous uh, in this time period, and that's going to make her vulnerable. And the U.S., on the other hand, is going to be stable, uh, again, because they did not take on uh, those types of... of, of um, of issues and fundamental changes. And so in that short run, the United States uh, became a Goliath uh, largely from the beginning through the, uh, the Secretary of Treasury, Alexander Hamilton. Uh, he created a national bank, created a system, began a system of, of subsi subsidizing key industries, uh, uh, particular, uh, particularly um, the new textile industries and uh, infrastructure. And um, then you had a Supreme Court uh, that was very conservative and created a business friendly environment in the US. And I have some cases here that you could see, right? Uh, and uh, not to mention, uh, as it says here, uh, as the federal government legally and theoretically grew in strength, it began to flex its muscles regarding federal domain. And so they had taken the Ohio Valley from the Native Americans and from the British in the War for Independence during the, the the failed Confederacy, and they began to make states of them in the in the teens of the 1800s, at the end of the War of 1812, um, and encouraged a lot of poor white, ambitious, um, and black uh, Americans uh, to migrate into the Ohio Valley, uh, and then they also, in the Seminole Wars, at the end of the War of 1812, etc., they took Florida, they took Spanish Florida by 1819 and parts of Mississippi and Alabama. 
And so they were very aggressive and they were very um, uh, generous, uh, sa- states Paul Johnson as an historian, in granting out cheap available lands to the common American people. And the American people just, it, they were insatiable, their, their desire for land, and not to mention demographics of, of American population growth uh, beginning in the mid 1700s and, to, and continuing to take off in the 1800s. And so the poor white Americans in particular wanted to move to the frontier to start over, to get a chance for cheap, fertile land. Uh, and then they were offered uh, such in, in Mexican, sp- first Spanish and then Mexican Texas. You see there the Louisiana Purchase <clears throat> of 1803, and that opened up uh, the federal territories. They were put under a hand-picked group of men uh, for the time being before they became states, but they encouraged settlement therein, and eventually those became states, obviously. And so people settled in them. Uh, you have uh, the Trail of Tears kicking the Native Americans off their land and offering that fertile land in, in Georgia and in the Carolinas in particular uh, to uh, the, the, the poor white people. Uh, the Scots-Irish in particular came and flooded in large numbers from the time of the War for Independence through the early 1800s and to particularly through the Cumberland Gap of the Appalachian Mountains. Uh, into uh, Tennessee and Kentucky. And then you have the story of Texas uh, and its, um, its, its generosity, its liberal uh, hand uh, offering great opportunities for gringos to come into that land, right? And some people would say that they, they, they received the excuse that they were looking for uh, with Santa Ana's uh, uh, uber conservative uh, constitutions. He had two of them that were very uh, conservative. He wanted to be, uh, have power over the Cortez over or, or the Diputacion, the, the Congress of Mexico. Uh, he handpicked the governors. The governors in turn handpicked uh, local gentlemen. And so it, it took away from a lot of representative government. And so that was the Alamo case and, uh, and them fighting for uh, the um, the independence of Texas. So you have that story here, and then you have the beginnings of the Mexican-American War, and you see, again, in a very aggressive government and people uh, that were um, encouraged uh, by the federal government to move along the overland trails. Uh, 1843 was a big year uh, in, in gringos coming across the country. And um, <clears throat> you have the Bidwell Bartleson group, uh, that was allowed to, uh, to uh, come into the far west. Uh, you also had the uh, Spalding group that was allowed to go into uh, British Oregon, and they formed the nucleus of gringo colonies, of American colonies in Oregon and in California. And the Mexican government allowed that to happen, uh, supposedly under the supervision of Johann von Suter or John Sutter. And so uh, you have all that going on. And so, you know, you, you just have, like I said, uh, then it's a tale of two cities. Uh, Mexico's uh, was known for political instability. Uh, in one, one term, it was just crazy. Uh, the stats, there were like 40, 40 something administrations in 40 something years uh, in, in one uh, particularly chronological block. Of, of early Mexican history. And so uh, that made them vulnerable. And California was no different. Uh, you had different times. You had two, um, uh, two individuals claiming to be the governor of Texas simultaneously and having like these mini civil wars that were not bloody at all, but nevertheless were civil wars uh, filled with civil strife in Mexican California. And then also you had the paucity of people, right? The, the scarcity, uh, they're, they're just... They could never get enough people into Mexican Texas, into Mexican California in particular, Arizona somewhat the same. New Mexico was probably an exception with lots of, of, of ethnic Mexican people there. Um, and so it led them, it, it led them to be uh, vulnerable for an American takeover. And then the Democratic Party promised votes and lands, particularly California to the voters 
and uh, James K. Polk comes in as the bad guy, John Tyler before him, and says, I want Texas to be annexed to the U.S., and I want uh, to, to purchase, uh, forcefully purchase, uh, California from Mexico. And, um, and then they, they provoked a fight over the border uh, between the Rio Bravo del Norte, or we call it the Rio Grande uh, River, uh, versus the Nueces River. And so they sent soldiers in that disputed territory. And of course, they got the fight that they wanted. And the Mexican-American War ended with American victory. But by then, like I said, so you have American uh, temporary stability. You have the administration of, um, of the Hamiltonian uh, economic policies of subsidizing and helping businesses out and, and, uh, and promoting infrastructure. Uh, with communication and transportation networks and so forth. You have a very liberal American policy uh, when it came to uh, offering cheap uh, fertile lands to Americans uh, in Western frontier areas. And you had Mexican vulnerability with um, them taking on key issues and having lots of, of, of um, coups, uh, et cetera, and instability in Mexican territory. All right, and so just some; those are some of the basics on um, on that first one. But let me go ahead and go back to the test. Uh, are you doing okay so far, Ephraim? Thank you, thank you, Ephraim. All right, and so then you have a uh, part two. Uh, in Latinos and Turner's West handout, how does the writer refute or challenge Turner's thesis? Remember, Turner's thesis was that the West renewed American meritocracy. It renewed uh, the e equality of economic opportunity, supposedly, in the West, because they were equally, uh, because supposedly the dangers and the opportunities that arose in the West were indiscriminate. Uh, they didn't discriminate, right? And so you have the rivers that you could drown in. You could be gored by uh, by uh, wild bison or roaming cattle. Uh, you could be uh, have someone get the drop on you in the canyons. Uh, you you had all kinds of of dangers that that you faced coming across the West, and supposedly it didn't matter how wealthy you were or who you were on the East Coast. Those dangers were indiscriminately there uh, to be faced by everyone. And then you also had opportunities. And uh, the main opportunities seemed to have been entrepreneurial, uh, some type of business oriented. Uh, you uh, had the Mormons who ferried people across a couple famous rivers uh, for uh, exorbitant um, prices and made a lot of money therefrom. Uh, you had people mining the miners. Uh, when miners came in the gold rush and so forth, uh, Sam Brandon and others selling pickaxes and shovels to them at high prices. Uh, the Chinese did very well for themselves uh, with their independent businesses and their, uh, their uh, products and services that they offered to the, uh, to the miners. And so supposedly if you were, if you were adaptive enough, if you were quick witted enough, business savvy enough, uh, you could prevail in the West, uh, in this dangerous wild West, right? And um, and you had er you had areas and time periods of lawlessness in some of the regions where they had to resort to vigilantism and so forth, and that all lends to his thesis. But what it doesn't pay attention to is the blatant discriminatory behavior of Anglo settlers in the West toward particularly Hispanics. And, and, and Asians, right? And so you have evidence in this number uh, in the newspapers uh, from um, congressmen and senators uh, and governors, et cetera, of just blatant discrimination, right? The Mexican character is made up of stupidity, obstinacy, which is stubbornness, ignorance, duplicity, and vanity. Um, uh, science at that time put humanity into different racial groups, ascribing inherited and immutable, unchangeable characteristics to each of the groups. Uh, 
and so the Latinos were not were not did not fare well uh, with those types of sentiments and that type of uh, so-called scientific environment. Uh, there was anti-Catholicism as a sentiment of the 1800s that was very strong, and that was just a further thing that hurt Mexican Americans, as most of them were demographically uh, Roman Catholic. Um, and look what Zachary Taylor said about, or I'm sorry, Winfield Scott complained to DC regarding American war crimes against Mexicans that would make heaven weep, like raping Mexican women in the sight of tied up Mexican men. Um, so it wasn't just that we were fighting, that there was an irrational, emotional pathos to it, right? Uh, that, that was undergirded by, by these, these racist, sentiments that Anglo-Americans had toward Mexican-Americans. They called them greasers um, uh, in the 1800s, all right? And so you see plenty of evidence of, of racial discrimination. You have the foreign miners' taxes. You have the fact that in vigilantism, there was an especial um, uh, ferocity against bandidos, against Mexican-American or Mexican immigrant uh, uh, bandits. Uh, the Texas Rangers in particular uh, had a horrible record of how they treated Mexican Americans and Mexican immigrants. And, um, and then you have the, the fact that Anglo corporations just absolutely took over um, <clears throat> most of the land, most of the resources, and took over the major industries in which the Hispanic population is largely going to be employed uh, down at the level of the proletariat of the manual laborers. So particularly mining, uh, cattle ranching, uh, not immediately with, with farming, uh, commercial farming, as you're gonna see later on in the next century, uh, but the, the origins of that started rather immediately um, because at that time through the coolie labor system, it was initially Asian labor, uh, usually in the Western farms, uh, at least in California. All right, and so, um, yeah. So Turner's thesis doesn't put into account all those things, right? And so hopefully you'll feel okay with writing a few words about that. Then number three, from the Latinos in the industrial era handout, evaluate how credible the writer's support is for the argument that Latinos were pigeonholed and virtually stuck in the proletariat in the working laboring class. And I, I asked you um, to look at the Gilded Age handout. Uh, in particular, when you look at the Gilded Age handout, take a look at number two, I believe it is. Let's see here. Karl Marx was right. Capitalism is an unfair economic system rigged for the rich. Take a look at this section, all right? And look at the advantages that big corporations had over mom and pop entrepreneurs. Uh, the advantage and, and the, the, the domination they, they possessed over their workers, over their own workers, all right? So I would encourage you to, to take a look at number two on this supplemental handout that I posted for your class, okay, Efrain? And so, um, yeah, so... Having looked at that and look at the robber barons and the way that they, um, they, they dominated their own industries and took over entire industries, uh, right? This happened in the, in the West and in the Southwest as well, all right? And so in light of that, uh, you see that, um, let's look at the handout, particularly on Latinos in the industrial era. Let's see, where is it? So ranches, railroads, mining corporations. You have contract agents that set up jobs for Mexican Americans and Mexican immigrants. Uh, very low paying jobs uh, with a dual wage system. They played, uh, they paid uh, Anglo Misspelled that. 
Anglo workers, one salary and Hispanic workers, another, uh, obviously lower uh, salary. You have a description of some of the hard drudgery that they were um, confronted with. Uh, also mechanization of production gave small Hispanic farmers no fighting chance against the big corporations with the big me the mechanical reaper and thresher and harvester combine, et cetera. Uh, the pneumatic and hydraulic drills and, and mining uh, just didn't give them much of a chance at all. Um, again, the Texas Rangers kept the Mexican Americans in their place, as they said, in that, that parlance of that day. Uh, and they basically, as, uh, as the historian that I'm citing, uh, Acuna, uh, said that the Texas Rangers were paid assassins uh, by way of the big corporate ranchers, Anglo ranchers. And so uh, Hispanics, they, a lot of them, despite the promises of the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo, they lost their, uh, a lot of uh, portions of their lands that they couldn't, quote, sufficiently prove ownership of. Uh, they had people contest them in, in, in the court of law uh, to such a degree that lawyer fees, et cetera, uh, uh, bankrupted some of them. Uh, they outright used extortion and intimidation and, and physical violence to take, uh, squatters did, to take portions of the rancheros lands. Um, uh, when the workers tried to, um, the Hispanic workers tried to uh, unionize, most of the standard unions did not accept them because they were Hispanic. Uh, so they oftentimes had to unionize amongst themselves, which they didn't have all the resources like the AFL and the Knights of Labor and other major labor unions had. And then when they did, they usually cracked down on them. And then there were no laws. There were no laws uh, you know, regarding glass ceilings. Uh, regarding the fact that they just wouldn't promote to supervisor foreman positions, much less higher position than that, um, hardly any Hispanic workers. They kept them down in the proletariat. Um, and so when they didn't have much of a fighting chance as entrepreneurs against the big corporations. All right. So something to think about for that one. And then part four, all right, this one's worth 20 points. From the Latinos and overseas imperialism in the progressive era, defend or refute why US policies in the Philippines and in Puerto Rico were rather predictable, knowing the context of that era and the context of the progressive movement, all right? So how were they quite um, predictable? Uh, for one, perhaps uh, in some part of your write-up, state what those conditions were like. And of course, right, in the, with those conditions, uh, let's see here, wrong one, sorry. I have Latinos and imperialism in the progressive era. I did have the right one, sorry. All right, and so, um, we're going to get back to this context here of number one. Okay, I see what I did is I put the regular uh, US history assignment of imperialism uh, it, on this assignment, asked you to read through it to give you context. So I didn't need to give you the US assignment. I had already done so. I had copied and pasted it. Uh, but what I wanted you to do is to choose between numbers five and six. Okay, so with number five, right? Notice what they did. Let's see. Sorry about this. All this is context. Nevertheless, that Puerto Rican powers were subject to American oversight is telling. Um, 
Consequently, Puerto Ricans could run for off for city office and for membership in the lower national branch, the assembly, but they were not initially chosen as provincial governors nor as members of the upper branch of the national legislature, the council, which had veto power over the assembly. Nevertheless, in a system of rewards and punishments, Puerto Rican politicians could count on progressively more offices available for them as they practiced good old progressive civic virtue, um, which was supposed to end in eventual complete self-government. So they were put under a system of tutelage whereby they could participate to a certain degree in self-government, but, but that degree was highly limited, right? Highly restricted by the US. Those, uh, those in the key positions of power with veto power over the native Puerto Ricans were Americans themselves. So a very paternalistic type of government, right? Where the, the, the US is acting like a father figure uh, over the Puerto Rican people. And the same thing here, right? Uh, with the Filipinos. Uh, let's see here. Right here, the American occupiers permitted a Filipino national legislator to be elected to share power with an American commission and many appointed posts went to native Filipinos. At the local level, regional governors were elected, most of whom identified with the Filipino educated elite known as the Ilustrados, um, as were town council members and one uh, member of provincial regional boards, albeit the other two regional board members were handpicked Americans. This was a paternalistic endeavor to get Filipinos gradually accustomed to ruling themselves with American tutelage, all right? So notice in both these cases, perhaps I'll do this one blue as well. Um, this is kind of stating the, the type of government uh, that was instituted in each of the island countries, all right? Um, now the context, how is, that, how is that rather predictable? Well, for one, right, the science of the day, as you look at number one, uh, at the beginning of this handout, Ephraim, uh, it, it gets into the science of the day, and there was a lot of, of um, a lot of angst and a lot of, of elitism uh, in these, these um, ideas that were percolating at the end of the 1800s. Uh, with the angst, right? The, a lot of social Darwinism, a lot of the idea that, that life is about survival of the fittest, Life is in inherently dangerous and inimical to your well-being, and that you have to struggle and fight and be aggressive to even survive, much less thrive, right? Uh, but then there was the notion uh, by Gobineau and, and Chamberlain that you see down here, uh, whereby they said that they thought different races, their concept of, of races, right, of, of that type of categorization of humanity that with certain races of people that they were bound to fight one another for scarce resources and, and survival eventually, uh, but particular for scarce resources under the ideas of Malthus, uh, that there were too many people in the world and not enough resources for uh, sustaining all the people. And so um, then you have these ideas of exospecies evolution and that certain races were further evolved uh, physiologically, culturally, uh, than other groups. And so, of course, you can take a guess as to what groups they scientifically, um, you know, surmised were, were the most progressive and advanced. Uh, Anglo-Saxon, Teutonic, people from Northern and Western Europe, uh, the British Isles, right, in Western Europe uh, in particular. And so other peoples, they put lower on this spectrum of, of evolution, uh, including uh, people that were Iberian uh, from Spain and Portugal, and uh, people that were Malay, uh, for, uh, like the Filipinos uh, that were ethnically Malay uh, and um, culturally Hispanic. And so, um, or a mixture of Malay and, and Hispanic. And so they felt like they were scientifically inferior uh, to Anglo-Americans, that they were not as evolved, they were not as intelligent, 
uh, and that they were more animal-like, uh, that they lacked self-control, uh, et cetera. So you see that in, in some of these, in the write-up on number five again, going back to it, is uh, I want to go back to more of the beginning of it rather than just look at the, the hard facts of the type of government that they had. All right, Ephraim. Um, look what they said here. The more highly educated classes of the population show little, if any, desire to subordinate selfish ends to public considerations. It, it, it's the idea of like, like with Freud, right? That, that, that childlike, animal-like people, um, and this is so out of vogue and ridiculous now uh, in, in with today's ideologies and worldviews. Uh, but this was what was believed, supposedly accepted at the, in this generation of the 1890s, is that um, that some people were not as evolved and that they, they simply followed their id, right, their ID, uh, their Freudian id, just their passions, their natural impulses, just like an animal uh, that had no qualms about engaging in sexual activities or going to the bathroom publicly in front of an audience, that they had no shame. Uh, that they would, um, and not that they went to that degree with the Filipinos and the Puerto Ricans, but I'm just saying that that's the, the, the Freudian type argument is that when, uh, when you follow your id, you're rather childlike, you're not civilized, you're not progressive, uh, you just follow your natural impulses, and you lack that, that, that capacity of reason, uh, or, or your, your, um, your superego, as he called it, right? your internalized parents uh, telling you, no, don't do that. That's not proper. That's not correct, et cetera. And so one example of being further evolved was having civic virtue, uh, being able to subordinate your own selfish desires and your own uh, passions and emotions uh, to reason, to logic, uh, to the well-being, the general welfare, to the, the greatest good for the greatest number, if you will, uh, quoting the utilitarians of that of the 1800s. Um, and so um, they felt like they couldn't trust uh, the Filipinos and the Puerto Ricans and these other Hispanic groups uh, to govern themselves. They didn't need to be treated uh, in a very paternalistic way by Americans to teach them proper government, to, to govern along with them and over them. And that was, that was very characteristic of the sciences, the so-called sciences. And, and ideas that were percolating that you see on number one of this handout. And it was also very typical in light of the progressives. Um, when you look at the progressive handout, right? They were very, uh, they were very, they had a very paternalistic uh, flavor to them as well. Uh, their approach uh, to the less fortunate. Um, you look at, uh, let's see here. This will allow me to move down. So court history of the do-gooders, right? Take a look at this. Uh, the settlement house projects, Jacob Reese and him helping out those at the five points of New York and the desperately poor, uh, offering services to the less fortunate, uh, et cetera. But of course, who, was in, who were in control? Uh, the, the old middle-class, um, educated elite progressives, because uh, they were the ones that were schooled in sociology, in psychology, in political science, in economics. And they believed that there were natural laws that, that, that most entities and institutions operate under. And that it was a matter of education, of, of discovering what those natural laws were, right? Uh, that, that, that governed economics, government, uh, sociology, uh, human interaction between individuals and groups and their peers, et cetera, in their society. And so uh, they didn't trust the uneducated to run things uh, because of that. They, had a, they were very educationally elitist in that respect, I would say at least subjectively. And so again, that's typical, right, of these progressives. Uh, the Thomasites and, and the others that moved into these countries in the Caribbean and in the Pacific and uh, brought American education and uh, American uh, educated officials and so forth. 
they were doing it supposedly very paternalistically for the betterment of these island people, but, but with the assumption that these island people were not yet ready to govern themselves, that they needed uh, instruction uh, by these educated, well-meaning progressives uh, in the Philippines, in Puerto Rico, uh, for four years after the Spanish-American War in Cuba, et cetera. All right. And so to that respect, I would say that the paternalistic um, you know, system of tutelage uh, that we put these island people under uh, was rather um, emblematic, was, was rather emblematic of the times, uh, of the ideas that were percolating at the time and with the progressive movement. So Ifrain, um, do you have any questions? Have I made this somewhat more clear for you? Do you feel any better uh, about facing this test um, having listened to me? And please be honest if you have any questions. Uh, for the lesson, we have to write a one page, right? Yes, for the last one, I would appreciate if you wrote approximately a page. Just a, a approximately would be great. Okay. Okay. So yeah, I, I should have all of these attached um, uh, on your Canvas page under modules. And so please take full advantage of that. And um, yeah, uh, that's, that's kind of the gist of, of what I intended on this test. All right, so uh, any last minute questions, Efrain, before I, I go ahead and bid you adieu? Uh, no, I don't have no more questions. All right. Well, thank you, man. Especially being the only one that attended today, I'm going to give you 10 points. I'm going to add 10 points to your test score, okay? I'm making a note of that right now. All right, Efrain. Well, that's it for me, if that's okay with you. Uh, if you don't have any other questions or concerns, um, I, I wish you well. I wish you good luck on this test. I, and um, I hope that I was of some help. Thank you. Thank you, Efrain. Have a good one. You too.